Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the opening session of our 2020 National Pharmacy Association Conference. It's our first virtual conference, so we'll be really keen to have your feedback on how you find the experience. We have a number of sessions spaced out over the next four days. You'd be pleased to hear we're not asking anyone to sit in front of Zoom for hours on end. So if you like this session, then feel free to register for one or more of the others. Details are on the website and all over social media. So for our first session today, and to give our keynote speech to the conference, we're absolutely delighted to welcome Matt Hancock, Secretary of State for Health and Social Care. If Matt wasn't a household name before this crisis, then I'm sure he's recognised by many more people now. He's been at the heart of tackling the pandemic, leading from the front and coordinating the response from the Department of Health and Social Care. Now, some of you might also remember that this time last year, we were looking forward to welcoming Matt to speak at our annual conference in Manchester. But unfortunately, the Conservative Party leadership contest got in the way. We were delighted, of course, to have Seema Kennedy, pharmacy minister at the time, step in to cover for Matt. And I'm really hoping today, as we are so close to starting now, that there's little chance of Matt getting called away to a crisis meeting. Now, during the last few months, Matt has spoken about community pharmacy, pharmacists, and pharmacy teams on a number of occasions. I should say though that in my experience, he's not a newcomer to the sector at all, nor was he unaware before the crisis of the important role that community pharmacies play. I remember accompanying Matt on a visit to one of his local pharmacies in Newmarket in February 2019 less than a year after he became health secretary in July 18. In fact, I think, Matt, last Thursday was your second anniversary of your move from being secretary of state at DCMS to secretary of state at DHSC. So congratulations on that. When we were in Newmarket, Matt was very interested in learning how the pharmacy worked and all the challenges it faced. I remember Anil Sharma, one of my board members, who jointly owns Lord's Pharmacy, explaining how the drug tariff worked. Matt explained then, he saw community pharmacy as a hugely underused asset for the NHS, in terms of being able to deliver a much wider range of clinical and public health services, playing a part in tackling health inequalities and taking the pressure off the rest of the healthcare system. Now, some of you will have seen that over the weekend, the MPA launched the findings of an independent public survey, looking at their perceptions of pharmacy over the last three months. In short, the public think pharmacies have played a critical role during COVID-19 with 89% seeing their role as essential. 55% of people have visited a pharmacy for medicines and healthcare advice during lockdown. And interestingly, 78% of people think we have about the right number of pharmacies. Going forward, the public want to see NHS pharmacies play a greater role in healthcare. 78% of them value a face-to-face -face relationship with their pharmacist. 74% want pharmacies better integrated with other NHS services. 84% say the NHS should do more to make use of pharmacist skills. And finally, 71% think pharmacies should expand their offering to take pressure off the NHS. Now, in terms of how the session is going to run this morning, 
Matt's going to speak, and then we should have some time for questions. If you're an MPA member and you want to ask a question, then please type it into the Q&A box. When Matt finishes, we'll try and take as many of those as we can before the Secretary of State has to leave us. Now, finally for me, the Secretary of State might not be aware of this, but this is actually a special occasion for community pharmacy. Apparently, the historians tell me it's the first time in decades that the Secretary of State for Health has spoken to a pharmacy conference. So we are delighted Matt has seen the opportunity to do more with the sector, and we're really looking forward to hearing his thoughts today. Matt, over to you. Well, thank you very much indeed for that very warm and kind introduction. And I was thinking today about how do you give a keynote speech over Zoom? It's a, uh, it's a novel experience for me, and I'm sure it's a novel experience for you as well. Um, and what I think is best is if I speak for 10 minutes or so, then let's leave as much time as possible uh, for Q&A. But before we do the Q&A, there is something that I want to say, and I want to say it to every single person who's watching, and I want to see it, say it to every single person who's working in community pharmacy. And the central thing that I want to say is that we value the work that you do. And for those who didn't understand the importance of community pharmacy before the crisis, by God, by, the, by how you worked, by how you stayed open, by how you served your community in the midst of the peak of the crisis, you have done your duty and you've stepped up to the plate. And for that, on behalf of all the communities you serve, I want to say thank you. Now, as you said, I've long appreciated the value of community pharmacies and the role that they play deeply entrenched in the communities that they serve. The clue is in the name. And throughout my two years as Secretary of State, I've sought to move the system to get to a position where we support more and ask more of our community pharmacists. Because I'm certain that you are an untapped resource who, when asked and supported to do more, can provide better care in our communities and can make sure that people get a better service out of the entire NHS family. I see you as a critical part of that NHS family. And you are at the forefront of where the community and the citizens who we all serve meets the NHS. So it's been part of my mission to make this country a little bit more like France, as I've said before, where the pharmacy is the first port of call. Now, I'm glad that we've been able to make some progress in that direction, but I know that there is much, much more that we need to do. I wanted to set out four areas today where I think that there are opportunities and challenges, and that we must turn those challenges into opportunities. The first, and you won't be surprised to hear me talk about this, is the opportunity that comes with technology. Because the crisis has unlocked leaps forward in technology, especially in outpatient primary and pre-primary care, in a way that we wouldn't have expected to see for years, but that happened in a matter of a few weeks. And I've seen in action the better technology working in pharmacies where the data and the records are linked to the rest of the health system and where people can get a better service because of the technology. Ultimately, we care about that technology because we care about people. Now, the technology though is only a functional means to an end. It only matters because of the improved service. And it matters because it allows pharmacy to be more integrated and better connected into the rest of the NHS. By having a common understanding of the whole person, it means that when there are those vital face-to-face -face interactions, each part of the system knows 
what the rest of the system is doing for any one patient, for any one individual. This is a hundred times better than a system in which a patient interacts with all different parts of the NHS, yet each part doesn't know what the other part has been saying or doing. And off this basis of the NHS as a platform, can we provide much better services and we can devolve services so they're delivered closer to the ground, closer to the community, and ultimately, therefore, increasingly through community pharmacies. So I see investment in technology and the opening up of, uh, of data, properly secured, of course, as a critical part of the integration of pharmacies into the rest of the NHS as we move the whole NHS to an increasingly system-based approach where a geography has responsibility for the health of those who live within it and all parts of the NHS all play their part in keeping people healthy. So that's why technology is so important to me. It's because it helps improve the services that we are there and duty bound by our communities to deliver. The second area uh, of, that is absolutely critical is tied to the first. And that's community pharmacies playing a bigger part in primary and pre-primary care for the communities they serve. You are far, far more than just experts at dispensing, although you're the best in the business at that. You are far more uh, than merely the ability to sell all sorts of goods and products that people need, because you are our eyes and ears on the ground and you understand the patients who we serve. So I want to see the continued drive that was set out in the community pharmacy contractual framework, which sets out a roadmap for extending clinical services into pharmacy. And that will allow us to reduce pressures on other parts of the health and social care system. Now, some of these new rollout of these services have been paused due to COVID-19. But take the commitment from me. That pause is temporary and is for as short a period as possible. Rightly, pharmacies focused on core tasks of safely supplying drug, drugs and medicines to patients. And by God, you did that, including bringing in new delivery rounds, including opening when every other shop on the high street was shut. Now we want to continue the drive and restore the expansion of these services that we've agreed to and set out in the framework. For example, I'm keen to see people with minor illnesses referred to community pharmacy to take pressure off GPs and crucially deliver a better service. And I realize that the pandemic has made this more challenging, incredibly important infection control procedures, for instance, of course make life more difficult. And NHS 111 has also sought to avoid referring to people to face-to-face -face treatments unless that's absolutely necessary. However, the opportunities are huge. 20 million GP appointments could be referred to community pharmacists every year, and there's much, much more that you can do. So I look forward to the continued rollout of more and more clinical services with the goal that all pharmacists should be operating at the top of their qualifications, at the top of their license, engaged with and supporting the communities who we serve to get the very best possible treatment as close to home as possible. The third thing that I want to touch on is more efficient dispensing. I want to free up more of your time, make the system less bureaucratic. I want to ensure more efficient dispensing to create more capacity for these clinical services. And for instance, the hub and spoke dispensing models, which I've seen working effectively, we need to make sure that they're rolled out. Now, I know that getting this right and fully delivered requires a change in the law. And I know that some in the sector have concerns, but I can assure you that we will consult with you as we work through these changes and we will make dispensing more efficient in order to be able to free up time for the things that people really care about to make sure that you're spending as much time as you can face to face with your customers, our patients, the citizens who we serve. The final point I wanted to make is this. 
we all know that having had an incredibly difficult six months, the next big moment is as winter approaches. We're currently planning in detail for winter and we're expecting high demand and pharmacies will play a critical role. There's a huge amount of work to do. We still don't know the long-term health impacts of coronavirus. We still have just one treatment that's clinically proven to be effective in reducing its impact. We're working hard on a combination of the COVID vaccination program should a vaccine work, and of course, the science on that is as yet unproven. And of course, the biggest flu vaccination program in history. I want to see pharmacies involved in that flu vaccine rollout. And I think that you have an incredibly important part to play. And we're working now on how a COVID vaccine rollout will work. And we're going to, frankly, need to use all of the capabilities at our disposable to deliver the vaccine programs that we need to in the months ahead. And this, of course, links back to the core of what pharmacies do so well, which is by being the eyes and ears on the ground, by understanding your communities and being deeply embedded in them, you can help prevent people getting into a more serious condition, which obviously takes the pressure off the arrest of the NHS, but critically is also the best thing for the people who we serve. And let us therefore work together, let's work hard, let's push this as fast as we can to make sure that pharmacies, as the first port of call for healthcare for our country, are deeply embedded as we drive forward our efforts to ensure that the NHS is always there for everyone, whether in the midst of a pandemic or thereafter. So I'm grateful to you for all of your work I'm grateful to you for all of your engagement. I know that there are difficult issues that we have to resolve in order to get where we want to go. But I hope that you will come with me on this common mission to ensure that our pharmacies play the fullest role they possibly can as the front line in the community of our NHS. Thank you, Matt. Thanks very much. Now, this is the, uh, the tricky part of the session where I have to try and uh, navigate a long list of, of, of questions and, and hopefully uh, tr- trans- translate them or, or, or read them across for, for Matt to, to answer. <coughs> I'm trying to sub- put them into sections because there's a few around particular themes. So maybe an opening question, Matt, and um, you know, you, you acknowledge there some of the difficult history Um, with the sector and and the department. There's a question here that says, many thanks, Matt. Really appreciate you taking the time to talk to community pharmacists. As a profession, community pharmacists have have often felt the Cinderella of the NHS family. In particular, we feel that NHS England has not engaged with community pharmacy. We hope the days of uh, briefing ministers that there are 3,000 too many pharmacies are over. Um, I hope during this crisis um, that uh, you've understood the benefit of face-to-face uh, uh, bricks and mortar pharmacies. Matt. Well, the day, the day that anybody at the top of the health system in this country thought that there were uh, that many, too many pharmacies, I don't even recognise the number. Uh, the day that that idea ended was the day I became Secretary of State. I, I'm, a, uh, I'm a huge believer in community pharmacy and I've seen it for myself. I've seen the benefit of it. We talked about our um, trip to Newmarket some time ago, but on all my trips to, uh, to pharmacies before, during and since the crisis, I, I'm, a, I'm a great fan and a great believer. Now, of course, um, we want to make sure that we can deliver services with the best possible value for money. But for me, the critical thing is delivering those services as close to home for people as possible. That is the entire direction of the work of the, of the NHS. And it's a direction that 
I, uh, I, I, I look forward to promoting. Good, good, absolutely. Um, Matt, and then we've got a, a couple of questions about the differences between community pharmacy in England and other devolved countries, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. And somebody asking, you know, is it, is it time now for a minor ailment service in England in the way that we see in other countries? Is it, do you want to say a little bit about the challenge of, the, of different countries? Well, I, I'm very happy to work with you on this idea. Um, I think that the, it, it, it clearly fits with the direction of travel. Um, and it also clearly fits with people's need to, um, uh, to get healthcare as close to home as possible. Uh, and in a way, uh, COVID merely accelerates what was, was already a necessary direction of travel, uh, both in terms of telemedicine and in terms of accessing services closer to home. Uh, we're, um, uh, we, we've already seen the provision in pharmacies, for instance, of equipment, um, both to be able to undertake um, tests and consultations with, uh, with consultants for those who don't have access to technology or for the vast majority of people who don't have uh, equipment for, um, for, for uh, basic tests. And um, so I'm absolutely up for this direction of travel. And I'd love to hear more from you about how you think it will best work. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you, Matt. And I'm scrolling through long lists of questions here. There's 30 odd questions. And I'm guessing probably half of them, Matt, talk about funding. Yeah. They talk, they talk about the challenge. And um, some of that is about, um, shall we say, business as usual funding pre, pre-crisis um, in terms of uh, you know, I think GPHC recently did a survey that showed 52% of pharmacies are actually losing money. So there's people talking about that side of the funding. And then as a second question, about some very specific questions around the cash advance that the um, government has made available. The three, I think it's 370 million now, isn't it, of yeah. money's brought forward. Yeah. And People saying, is it likely, will we have to repay that back? This is going to cause a problem. So two different elements to the funding. One, the sort of business as usual. And then secondly, the promises about um, covering the costs of the exceptional costs of COVID. Yeah. yeah. Look, on the, on the second, I, I, uh, I, can, I, I hear that call. Uh, I can't make that commitment uh, today, but I do understand the pressures in the same way that all retail has had um, a huge amount of pressure. And for those businesses that uh, essentially use the retail elements of their business uh, to, uh, uh, to support the bottom line um, and go over and beyond on those parts of the business that are contracted um, through the NHS, uh, I understand the, uh, the impact that the crisis has had. So uh, I, I, I can't make that commitment uh, today, but I, what I can tell you is that it's, some, it's something that I'm very much alive to. Um, the, um, but on the first point, um, I completely understand that if we're going to ask pharmacy to do more, this, that has to be uh, paid for. Of course it does. Um, but you know, the argument that, um, that, that works is that delivering many services through pharmacies is far better value for money than delivering them through any other part of the NHS. And so that's the, um, uh, that's the approach that I take. I can see in the questions, some quite specific questions about, um, uh, about funding for specific elements uh, of the contract. Um, I think that making sure that from the baseline of the agreed contract, as we uh, ask pharmacies to do uh, to, to offer, in a sense, if we as we offer pharmacies more and more um, uh, services, we need to make sure, of course, that we're paying properly for those uh, for those services to make sure that it works for both sides. Okay, and as you as you can see, Secretary of State, we've got some very specific questions as well around, uh, let, let's say, quite short term things. Hopefully, in terms of like the flu service. And one of our members from South London asking about, you know, recognising time is short and we need to work quickly on this. But there are still a lot of unanswered questions. This might be one for you to take back to 
to colleagues and, and NHS England in terms of definitive plans for delivery and understanding the possibility of cooperation with GPs as colleagues rather than as competition. Do you have an update on, on the flu service? Uh, oh, I don't yet, but the, there's a huge amount of work underway on that because, you know, there's no way that we can, um, if a COVID vaccine comes off, it's the inter- then there's no way that we can deliver that with, uh, within the, uh, the confines of the existing system. And uh, because of that challenge, uh, that has, um, that's meant that we've then got back to look at the delivery of the entire um, flu vaccine program. We want the flu vaccine program to be the biggest uh, flu vaccine program in history. Uh, we, are, we have procured the, enough vaccine to be able to deliver on that. Uh, but obviously, it's a big task to then get the vaccine into people's arms. And uh, so we're going to need much more. Um, we know, we're going to need teamwork across the board in order to, 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 to make that happen. One of the things I'm picking out, and I'm, I'm sure members would, would be unhappy if I didn't raise it, Minister, is the, um, there's often a misunderstanding, and I've picked this up myself with ministers, that um, for independent community pharmacies, most of their income does come from the NHS. Yes. If, you, if you're a big chain, a big national chain, then it looks very different because you've got all sorts of retail activities going on. But yeah. I think most of our members are earning 93, 94% of their income from their NHS work. And, and, and so one or two people I can see in the questions just asking me to, uh, to, to, to remind you of that. I, I, think, I think you're Yes, aware. of course. No, I understand. I, I, absolutely, I understand that. Um, and, in, you know, there are, there are as many different uh, business models as there are uh, pharmacy, uh, community pharmacy uh, companies. So, I, of course, I understand that. Um, the um, you know the, the the challenge is ensuring that we get a model that works for everyone. But you see, I see this. I see this opportunity here. I see this opportunity because there's more services that we want to uh, get down to the um, uh, closer into communities, um, and we need to make sure that as we deliver those, uh, because there's better value for money to be got from delivering those through pharmacies. Um, therefore, everybody can win out of um, more use of, uh, of, of community pharmacy. I mean, there's a, um, uh, and, and I can see in the comments, people saying, well, will we be paid exactly what a GP would be paid to do the same thing? Um, well, the, uh, the answer to that question is we need to make sure that you, are, uh, that you are rewarded for doing a service in a way that is uh, fair, good, and reasonable, and doesn't lead to the sorts of some of the comments that we're saying in the uh, comments section, um, uh, and make sure that there's value for money on the taxpayer side as well. So there's a there's a there's a there's a there's a there's an opportunity here for for all of us. Good. I'm conscious, Minister, of the of your timetable, and um, we're coming up to, if not, we're hitting quarter to one. Um, There are many, as you can see yourself, Minister, there are many more questions, lots of detailed questions about how could hub and spoke and more efficient dispensing work. I know the the MPA has done lots of work on that on the past. There's probably probably a huge amount of things to to pick up here, but at at least being able to see the questions as well yourself, you can see you can see that where people are, where people's concerns are. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to, to say to us before yes, you before you? Uh, I'm going to pick up on one, one final comment, um, which is um, uh, Sanjay Gamvir in the comments has said, I know you mentioned us as retail, but we're not retail. Please, going forward, I hope you'd include pharmacy fully in the NHS family. So I think this is a really important uh, point, and I strongly, strongly agree with you, uh, Sanjay. Um, it, makes a, um, it makes a big difference um, I think to the way that um, the way the system thinks about the role of community pharmacy, that as far as I'm concerned, you are a core part of the NHS family, um, uh, and the um, uh, the need to um, to embed that conceptually is for me very important. Um, just because the contractual arrangement is different, 
Um, in the same way that the contractual arrangement for GPs is different to hospitals and, yep. uh, and, yep. and trusts, um, that doesn't make you any less a, uh, a core part of the NHS family. And that's always been the pr principle that I've gone by. Um, but it is a, that is a, um, a change in the way that people have thought about community pharmacy. I think of you first and foremost in your NHS role. I acknowledge the role that you also play in providing other uh, non-medical, uh, non-NHS services um, like the retail function. Um, but for me, that, that is a secondary consequential of being the part of the NHS that is there in the community. That's how I think about it. That's how I think that our, um, our arrangements should be structured on that basis. And, um, uh, and that's that links to, sorry, Minister, that links to the point people were raising earlier that not, for the independents, 90 odd percent, exactly. some people say 95 percent, 97 percent of their income does come from that contract with the NHS. They, they don't have a huge amount of retail income beyond that. Exactly. Good. OK, well, thank you again, Minister, for, for taking the time to, to join us. We very much hope it won't be the last time that we have a Secretary of State speak to us. And uh, um, have a good day. Great stuff. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks, Sam.